play from beginning. Okay, cool. I came across this quote um, that reads here at the top, when one person teaches, two people learn. And it was by an American author and political activist who uh, I had never heard of before. And um, where the quote came from was actually the USA Water Polo Coaching Manual. And I put a link here. So if anybody wants access to this PowerPoint, uh, the link will be there. It's actually a great resource. And um, I, I do encourage people to, to click on that and check it out. Um, so yeah, Kendall, my hope is as I teach this to you, um, both of us will better understand uh, the things that we're, we're, we're talking about here today. Next slide. Okay. Before we get into the setter training um, videos and, and specific examples, I wanted to just go over uh, some of the stuff that I wasn't able to explain to you uh, over via text yesterday. And that is this idea of constraint-led uh, coaching. And uh, what this is, is um, it's kind of a new way of thinking, even though this is all not that brand new. Um, it's, it's certainly, I think, new in the sense that uh, as a traditional coach or athlete um, who has become a coach, uh, the traditional thing is to, of course, teach the things that you were taught and teach the way in which you were taught. Um, right. This new way of thinking, and I think it goes back, um, you know, you can see some dates here as, uh, as early as um, 1956. <clears throat> it, it's been around for a while. And the idea of the constraints-led uh, approach, or CLA, uh, it's a model of how humans develop and organize movement solutions. And uh, it's founded in two things. Uh, one, dynamical systems, um, again, a model of hu human movement. And it integrates uh, the ideas of ecological psychology, which uh, we won't get into too much detail on that, but I've cited uh, a few things here. Um, if there are some papers or books that people want to um, dig into that a little bit further. <clears throat> so constraint-led coaching, uh, in order to successfully employ it, um, you know, we have to understand kind of the key components of it to some degree. And that is an understanding of ecological dynamics um, being essential. Uh, and as you can see, it's the, I guess, uh, it's meant to say the term skill acquisition refers to a process of acquiring an increasingly functional relationship with a given performance environment. Uh, so it's, you know, when I read that, it's different than what I originally thought of skill acquisition um, where, okay, I have this uh, uh, ideal way of hitting a ball or setting a ball or using footwork in a given situation, um, and I can then employ it uh, again and again and again. Uh, well, actually, it turns out that there's a, a better way I've found, and it's what they're describing here. As skill acquisition is a way of um, being able to, I guess, I accomplish a given goal under different um, circumstances or variability, uh, and that being uh, the performance environment. So um, dynamical systems and ecological psychology concepts uh, are guiding principles for CLA practice design. And um, what practice would look like uh, under C uh, CLA, uh, for teaching and coaching would include these three things here, self-organization under constraints, uh, perception action, action coupling, and affordances. Uh, and, and those are um, fundamental concepts of the, I guess, mutuality of the performer and the environment, kind of as I was describing um, just there. So I'm gonna play for you here. Uh, this is Keith Davids. Um, he's a guy that I listen to and, and uh, read and watch a lot of uh, the things that he presents. And this was from a recent call uh, that he was on. And uh, I'm gonna kind of let him sort of take it away. It's just a small clip here um, of a conversation that he had, but he goes into uh, a little bit of what ecological dynamics is um, and he's, illustrated this spectrum that uh, 
you know, coaches and athletes uh, will, will be on depending on, you know, where that athlete happens to be uh, more to the right being, um, you know, less representative in design and, and to the left here being higher, higher representative design being more game like and, and the thing that we're trying to get to in practice uh, as quickly as possible to increase performance. Okay. So let's have a listen here. And if um, right away, if it's not loud enough, let me know and I can adjust the volume. But there is a continuum um, in which captures the information that's used to regulate action. So information regulating action is a key principle of ecological psychology as proposed by James Gibson. Um, and it's actually, a, we propose it as a key principle of practice task design in sport. And what we've said is, um, and can hope people can see the, my pointer arrow on the screen. Um, what we've said is, is that essentially uh, down at one end, you have more specifying information, if you like, that's the gold standard uh, for practice environment. So that in other words, if you want to become good at springboard diving, uh, or a fast bowling in cricket, ice climbing, you have to experience uh, practice and performance in those specific environments because the information that you use to regulate your actions, um, it's specific to those environments. And what we said in ecological dynamics is that um, these environments have higher representative design or they're higher in representative learning design to paraphrase um, uh, Egon Brunswick's work in ecological psychology. So this end here, it, uh, practice environments, learning environments, training environments are more specific. And down at the other end of the continuum, they're more general because the information is non-specifying. In ecological terms, that means less useful. So for example, you've got some images here of um, uh, people practicing dribbling against static cones that don't really reflect the information that a, an active defender uh, poses. Or if you're batting against uh, a cricket bowling machine, you're not getting the information that a fast bowler delivers up front. Now, under normal conditions, what we're saying is that it's better to spend more time down here, at this end here, for enhancing skills um, and um, to, to make sure that training and practice and learning is more effective. But somewhere along this continuum, each individual needs to be placed, um, depending on their journey, where they are, depending on if they're really at the beginning um, of their journey as a learner or if they're more advanced learners, somewhere along here, they need to be placed. And we've also given caveats that um, if, for example, you can't get to um, uh, a mountain uh, or a, a boulder, a, a rock to, to practice climbing, then an indoor facility will help you to maintain um, your climbing skills at a more general level. Um, now, the, the interesting thing with this pan pandemic at the moment that we're all facing is that what we in the past have thought for elite athletes would be the cases uh, of not spending too much time at the more general end that is actually probably more functional at the moment because of the lockdown situation where footballers can't play together in a team in, in terms of the social distancing principle. Um, swimmers can't go into a pool um, and so on and so on. Okay, I'm going to pause it there and then we can uh, just kind of go into the pandemic. Uh, this was a few weeks ago, but I understand you're able now to at least work with one individual. So there is a continuum. Um, so constraint-led approach, uh, the three core categories uh, of constraints, and, and this is really at the heart of uh, CLA. Um, those three constraints are the task, the environment, and the individual. And all of those three things together uh, must always be uh, in consideration with um, creating the practice design um, and you know, implementing the the activities or modifying and adjusting them, um, you know, as as you go, um, you know, through the interaction of the three core categories of constraints, a learner will self organize in attempts to generate effective movement solutions, and uh, and that ideal of self organization or autonomy is what a lot of people in the field say is like is the answer. 
okay? Um, and rather than us always feeling as coaches like we need to um, right the wrong immediately or advise and always um, push these athletes or, or fill them with these ideas of how to do things, um, we actually want to create an environment where they can self-organize and in a way self-discover those things on, on their own with, with some assistance from us. Because at the end of the day, we still want them to be their own unique athlete, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what you're getting at there is um, you, we all want our, our players to be able to go out there and be self-sufficient, um, self-reliant, uh, confident, right? Um, and, and when it matters the most or when it matters to them, right? And, uh, and I think you're exactly right there. Um, so skill acquisition develops from this functional relationship between the performer or the learner and the environment that we place them in. Uh, and so whether, you know, if you're on the low end of representativeness, presenting them with cones or tossing a ball, you know, into their platform or their hands, and then on the other end or somewhere in, the, in between, uh, you make the environment and drill more representative of um, the problems that they're going to face, the variability that they're going to face, the randomness um, that, that, that they're going to face in, in, in the actual game or performance. Uh, the specific focus on, on coaches. Uh, so we were just talking about that, designing learning activities that allow individuals or teams to self-organize and co-adapt to changing constraints. And, uh, you know, it's our job to, I guess, I've said this before, right? Direct the learner's attention within the environment, inform them where, tell them where to look, uh, but don't tell them what to see. Let them uh, discover that for themselves. So moving along, uh, I've thrown in some other examples in sport where modifying task constraints and environments to promote skill development and acquisition can be um, both creative and very uh, effective. And this is something that uh, I didn't know about before, um, but uh, here, you know, they're modifying the size of the rackets, uh, the ball even, um, is modified in weight and uh, the amount of pressure. So how hard they hit the ball, um, a ball with less pressure will be a little bit easier for these younger kids to, uh, to control. So I have, I think here on the next slide should be a video. Um, and I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, not everyone has. So we're gonna just take a quick look. We're not gonna watch the whole video, but the link will be there for anybody that wants. Um, I want us to look at how, um, for the younger athlete, the environment uh, was modified in a way that uh, really enables them to still learn within the context of um, the, ga the game's demands that they'll face uh, and how their interaction now in a more um, I guess modified or adjusted and capable environment, they can actually really learn some uh, some long term uh, developmental skills that they'll be able to advance at a very early age, uh, much faster than they would be able to if you know they were just a coach over there feeding them balls. So uh, hopefully this works. We'll check this out. Please move this window away from the shared application. No, I want to share it. <laughs> Hang with me here. This is a, a curveball that I was not anticipating. <laughs> so if I stop share and then I reshare, I should be able to get it. Okay. So what, like 10 seconds? Now here's the cool part. The number 
number of rallies and the time between contacts is very, very similar. Between the youth element age and the profession. Now on that one point, it's been great for So this to me is CLA at its finest. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, just so you know, I could barely hear what you were saying over the video. Oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, to me, this is uh, CLA at its finest. You know, it's um, the number of rallies and, uh, and the time between contacts going back and forth over the net <clears throat> were very, very similar between both age groups and, and levels of play. So to me, that is... Uh, that's awesome. They've modified the game in a way that is highly representative of of the real thing and what they'll be asked to do um, as they continue to get older and advance their skill. That is cool. Um, here's, we'll jump back into this. Uh-oh. Okay, um, and so, you know, here's maybe what these kids might have started with. Um, and, you know, this, this spectrum that Keith Davids was talking about, <clears throat> they move through those rather quickly, okay? And even a professional who is learning something new might be placed on the lower end of the spectrum of representativeness, and then once very quickly, he or she has an idea of what this new thing is, then you, then you slide your way up to the highly representative side. So this is not something that takes years and years or seasons to seasons. It should be within practices and within maybe, you know, uh, a week's worth of practice. So check this out. This was cool. So pretty cool stuff, right? Like we do that in volleyball. We have them hit against a wall or um, put a line on the wall and have them hit over it and things like that. Um, but uh, I think that this club has done a really nice job of, um, you know, creating these different environments that are appropriate for whatever skill level um, each participant starts at. Um, and ultimately everyone is then able to get to the highly representative stuff. That's really cool. Oh, oh spacebar goes to the next slide. That's cool. Okay, so skill adaptation. Um, and we're getting to the setting stuff, I promise. Uh, but all of these things are, are important because it, it, it gives way or reason to why I've decided to train setter um, development and, and footwork the way that I do. Um, and this idea of skill adaptation is something that I hadn't really considered until recently. Um, you know, I've always been chasing, hey, let's, let's get them to, to be perfect, to the ideal fundamentals um, and, and what have you, biomechanics. And I realized those things happen very rarely. In fact, um, there's a, a range within a particular skill that athletes need to have um, in order to become high performers. So skill adaptation uh, implies that performance goals can still be achieved, first of all, for everybody at every, any level. Uh, athletes learn uh, to vary their actions according to the information that emerges. Um, as we know, the game is random. So how you were taught to do one thing, you may have to adjust or adapt to the situation to do something similar um, ultimately achieve the same goal, uh, but in a slightly modified or different way. Adapta adaptation provides functional relationship between stability and flexibility during performance. So that is something that I encourage coaches to uh, be more open to if they aren't already doing that. Um, 
at adaptation and flexibility. A, a better term, uh, probably it's a better term to describe the process of an athlete becoming more skillful. As they get better, they develop more range, um, they're more capable of adapting to differences in the rally or in, in the um, situation that they find themselves in. Oh boy, I'm gonna have to share this now. Where are we? So the link's there so you guys can read up on this, but um, this, this guy was presenting a case for how the best at what they do in sports are are actually the most highly adaptive um, types of players. So we all know Aaron Rodgers, go Bears. Um, here is some video examples. Nelson, Jordy Nelson. Adapting his skill and footwork. Almost expired. Nelson. If you can't quite see it, he throws off his back foot, which is like, a huge no-no, right? If we're talking in terms of setting, you want our setters to shift their weight forward and square to their target before they, they let it go. Um, that would be like, we would want to see Aaron Rodgers set his feet then shift his weight from back to front and drive that football. Um, well, look what he does here to achieve the... Play clock almost expired. Pass. Gets rid of it on his Nelson. back. Jordy Nelson, touchdown. Um, so what, what, what I find is that these are not exceptions to the rule. These are not just, oh, well, we can't all be Aaron Rodgers. Okay, maybe we can't all be Aaron Rodgers, but we can all be encouraged or given the opportunity to have the free autonomy to adapt to, you know, however we see fit. Um, so here's another one. Good protection. Just a beautiful throw. Well, it's outstanding work because they go one on. And then the last one I'll show here, which I think is probably the one that really respond to his throws. Um, I found really interesting because I do this a lot in my setter training is I let them know that first of all, these sorts of adaptations and modifications are okay, but it's up to them to sort of, dig around, search around for different movement solutions for a given uh, goal. So watch. The receiver responds to his throws. His so I, I don't know a whole lot about quarterbacking and, and throwing a football, but what I, um, what I do know is that particular – throw there doesn't look like something that you would really drill down and teach you know what i mean um but hopefully you would create an environment where the search for new and different movement solutions are um are promoted are are invited are welcomed okay so many more slides before we get to Ethan. Let's jump to like some setting stuff and then maybe we'll go back to those other slides. I think I've shown you this one, right? So SSCGs, what are these? Um, they're, they're small sided games, right? Competitive games. And um, central to CLA is providing these opportunities to um, modify games where necessary, but ensuring that we are continuing to preserve um, the, the context of the game, uh, the competition, the, uh, the play. So uh, let's take a look at this one here. I wanted these kids to learn how to back set and nobody wanted to do it. They were having way too much fun, first of all, playing the, the two on two games we were playing, but they also had a fear of, oh, I don't know how to set backwards over my head. and I don't want to try that right now. You know, the stakes there are too high. I might look like a fool. 
Um, and this idea of small-sided game modifications and implicit learning, what I compromised with them was, okay, to start the rally, you must turn your back to the net and shoot the ball over with your hands. Okay, and, and look what we ended up with. We ended up with these kids no. stop setting. So, uh, again, all right, better than just creating a line and tossing balls or, or doing a partner back and forth and setting backwards, they're getting their turn, right? Everyone's going to get a turn at, at entering the ball with a back set. Um, mm -hmm. But they're, you know, they're learning it sort of with this uh, implicit learning or this wax on, wax off, right? Mr. Miyagi mm -hmm. style. Uh, yeah. I want to point out another reason why, and this is a little off topic, but another thing that's great about CLA and this, these self-autonomizing, um, I guess, ideals is take a look at what these kids did here. She, she, the, the, the player initiating the ball misses, and what's supposed to happen is uh, her team loses. They go back and split up at the end of the line. You know that. You've seen it in the gym. And the next group enters. Did you notice what happened? Um, they, they gave her the ball to try again. Yes. And I thought that was just so cool because, um, you know, I think of all the times as coaches, you're ye we're yelling at these kids to be organized, be efficient, to hurry up, to get that, you know, stop slowing the game down, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's essentially what these kids did for themselves. Hey, let's not slow our learning down. Um, and it's okay, like, hey, you made a mistake. Let me just give you this ball back. Firing another one, no big deal. And uh, rather than her, this player who missed, going to the end of the line and potentially having to sit with the, you know, failure she just had, her teammate, her peer, gave her an opportunity to, to forget about that and, and move on faster. You know what I mean? And, and I, like I she also went, I need to go this way because my ball went that way. Yes. And so, again, it's... And that's a great observation. And that's what we're getting at. It's this idea that if we can create the space and the environment for them to self-direct their learning, um, you know, most people don't like to be told what to do, right? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and and uh, it's, it, coaches are unique in a way that, okay, I don't want to listen to mom and dad anymore. This is my sport, my thing. I'm going to listen to my coach. Well, after a while, the same thing happens. Um, if you push a kid enough uh, and, and you're not motivating them in a way that motivates them, uh, there are some risks there and uh, they could tune you out. So yeah, that's a, a great observation. Uh, we'll skip this, but this guy ends up, you should watch this later. He flips, <laughs> this is like what, eight years old. He fakes and jukes and then flips the ball over the head to the teammate who then backpedals and scores the goal. It's, <laughs> it's really cool. Okay, so it looks like we need to turn the volume down on this next one. Um, gonna... Let me set this up here. This is the setter that we're going to be looking at. She's 13 here, and she's playing with our 18s. Um, and now we're going to get into setting and where we start, where I think we should start is taking a look at what does setting actually look like in the real context of the game and the patterns and things that we see, well, we should take that, slice it down if we need to and make that, um, the thing that we do in, in our training. Okay, so let's take a look at what setting, what setting looks like.
Okay, so we have a 13-year-old setter, 16-year-old setter, and a, a 17, 18-year-old setter. And uh, it all, the, the demands of the game kind of look the same for all of them, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found is there's less patterned footwork that you really see in a game um, that would be similar to the kinds of patterned footwork that we, we often teach setters in practice and, and setter, you know, clinics and things like that. And to me, the pattern that popped out was the variability of, of conditions um, given this, you know, one particular goal, you know, set outside, middle or right side that she had every time. Um, but how, sh how all the setters go about getting the ball there um, has, has a big range. So here we're going to look at um, the 18 setter. And again, watch the, now we're really going to start to watch the pattern and footwork and, and how she handles those situations. <laughs> I just want to pause it right there because um, I've gone away from really talking about specific footwork. You know, you had mentioned uh, your player was taught, was sharing with you this like four, four step pattern of some kind. What I now teach as a fundamental base for all setters are, um, are three things. You have to be ready to run or jump. Those are going to be the two, most physically demanding um, things that you will potentially have to do next. And so when we say, hey, be in athletic position, I, I take it a step further and say, be ready to do these two things because anything other than that will be easier and manageable um, or somebody else will have to set. Mm -hmm. So be ready to run and jump. Um, and let's have... Uh, our eyes on what is happening okay so really watching intently and closely on um, the visual cues that are going to determine how you react and respond and, and execute decisions right um, the last thing is this idea of balance and rhythm okay I don't care how you achieve balance and and, and just understand that on the scale of relative balance, the more balance you have, the more range and control and consistency you'll be able to achieve and accuracy. Okay, we can't all be perfectly balanced every time, but hey, if we can walk and run on one foot at a time, like we can dance, we can spin, we can do all these things, right? Without ever being taught through volleyball or sport, like we know how to stay balanced and and not fall <laughs> yeah. right yeah so that's what balance is and, and and rhythm you want to try to create some sort of uh, rhythm to um to what you're doing particularly with setting I like that <laughs> see like there's still some variability within or among these players you can see Izzy there uh, was able to use a footwork pattern to get there and use her hands right 
There's a ball way off net. She's able to get there and use her hands. And when I say, you know, take a look at what setting actually looks like, what I mean is let's watch. Let's watch and see what the game looks like. And let's see how athletes negotiate the playing environment and how they autonomously, like, come up with their own solutions. I'll give you another example. We all know that SpaceX recently had a successful launch for the first time in nine years, sending two American astronauts into space. And what NASA had talked about prior to the launch was how these engineers at SpaceX were coming up with solutions to things that NASA had solved many, 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 many years ago. But SpaceX had done it in a new and different way that these NASA guys said, we never would have thought to do it that way. You know what I mean? And now they've come up with, you know, new and, and better ideas that are different, but they solve the same problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think that should be a part of everything, including sport and training setters. Um, screen sharing has stopped. Window is closed. Okay, let's get back in there. Am I not on a slide? Okay, so I think I have, this might be more of the same thing. I think actually what I want to get into is going to be something else. Let's just share the whole screen. So let's look at uh, a recent match of NCAA. Again, which is what the setting looks like. In 12 in terms of efficiency it doesn't as the like, like back to serve. Down. On the season, in, Stanford in is hitting 284 against one of the toughest schedules anybody's ever seen. Oh, we don't want to give an easy one to Hens. Right side to Mosier. McClure is there. Both teams working hard at the defensive end. Right side. Good read that time by Mosier, number four in white. Simo into the cross court. Number 11, Savvy Simo. 5'10", senior. How do I get out of this? So, I mean, you know, that's what the game looks like. You know what I mean? And so those are the, some of the patterns that we're going to want to see. And I'm, I'm showing video of, of like college and professional level. And I'm trying to stay away from like the world's very best because that might feel like that model is a little out of reach um, and unrealistic. So easy. <laughs> What's that? They make it look so easy. Yeah, they, they, they make it look so easy. But what I'm going to show you now is a 13 year old and, and she was doing this when she was 11 and 12. You know, once I started working with her, we went entirely away from any kind of like drilled pattern work and started to take this full on CLA, um, you know, teaching method or approach. And I promise you, and, and I'm not the first one, this is not my own idea. Um, the experts will even tell you, regardless of age and gender, like fundamental movements look the same. Okay, so a, a step back fadeaway jumper by any basketball player trying to create space to get the shot off um, is going to look the same. And as far as their movement goes, and actually, if you recall in some of those setter clips of Izzy, you saw her fading away quite a bit. There were a right. lot of times where that was a um, more efficient movement solution to a ball being passed behind her or over her head. So uh, I think what I have here is, uh, is this with Alexis. Oh, you've seen this one, but 
Yes. That looks similar to the UCLA movement. Center, you just watch. A little bit of fade away as far as jumping back. Uh, but again, a, a similar solution. And you can see there how often, you know, we, we really need to be ready to run. You know, this is not a, a, a highly demanding situation here, but running happens to be, you know, the, the, crisp, the, the quickest, most efficient way for her to get there. And notice how she goes off of one foot. She's spinning. She's very dynamic, right? And, and athletic. Is what she's doing. And I will tell you that if we use um, external cues to help guide their movements and their discovery or their search for um, movement solutions that will work for them, you will find that they will do or much quick, much faster, they'll get to these solutions um, that we want them to get to and we often think we have to be the ones that teach it to them. No, in fact, we just have to be the ones that create the environment, maybe show them some examples and models. Um, or if they do one thing and it doesn't work, watch, put, put our hands behind our back for a second and let's close our mouth and just watch and see like what happens. You know, what do they do next? Um, and if we just wait a little bit longer before we uh, intervene, we may find that, wow, these kids are actually way more capable on their own than I give them credit for. Uh, so here are some just some other examples of, you know, soccer seems to get it right um, at the at the younger ages. And obviously they're, they're, you know, let's talk about their women's, our, our USA women's soccer team one of the most successful in the world, right? And, uh, and this is an example of external cueing. If they focus on these areas of the goal, we don't have to tell them how and where to face and how to kick the ball and, and yada, yada, yada. They will get there on their own by doing that. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and hockey gets it as well. Um, you know, uh, both are um, American hockey players and, and also especially the, the women, again, very successful um, on the world stage. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have a background in gymnastics. So, you know, modifying constraints and environments to, you know, advance their skill. Um, I, I did all of this, right? So you start here with, okay, well, you know, how do I support myself? You know, <laughs> if you've ever tried to hop on and do something like this, your first couple tries, you have no idea, like, it, how is this even possible? Yeah. And then you find yourself here on this mushroom is what it's called. And then you start to progress to, um, you know, ultimately the pummel horse, which is what you'll compete in at the, uh, you know, regulation levels and beam as, as well. But, you know, uh, in water polo, something that I don't have a ton of experience with, but um, the Australian women's water polo team, who has won a gold medal, two bronze medals, um, let's take a look at some of the things that they do to modify their task constraints and their environment and how they promote adaptive shooting sessions into their development. Um, this stuff, I thought, is is really cool. Back around. So this kind of gets at like the creative side of, you know, coaching is you know, how can I, instead of just telling them what to do, can I offer some different constraints 
to the task. Okay, the uh, you'll notice in some of those clips, the noodles. That will sort of implicitly do the teaching for, uh, for, for me. Let's have a listen to- Changing uh, at the last Richard second. The girls work. became very sensitive to actually who was shooting the ball, knowing how they shoot and pushing them out of their capabilities by stretching that noodle and reshaping it. So th there's a lot more to those things when you look at them. Um, and I think the athletes start to get into um, why they're doing it and they actually start working well together e with each other. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, there's a good, there's a good slide there. There's, there's some other information in here, but I know we're coming up on an hour now. So, um, as far as, you know, setter training, um, what are some other questions that you would have in terms of, you know, you ask me, how do I feel about footwork or how do I train it? What, uh, what questions do you have there? I mean, uh, I feel like, um, I mean, one thing that I did notice with Izzy and Alexis is their follow through also was really good. And I know I've heard you say palms to where you want the ball to go. Um, but their movement was also fluid. So to try and keep it away from, um, you know, too much drill like settings, you know, or if you are working with just one setter and trying to work on that, you know, rhythm and getting to the ball the fastest, uh, are there other cues that you would give? If that uh, makes yeah, th there are. And um, what I what I do and I, you know, I work one-on-one -on -one, um, once a week focusing on setting with Alexis. And uh, when I want to develop her range, the cues that I use um, is I recreate this, the exact or close to the exact scenario that she might face in the real game. So when we, here's one that we didn't look at. Um, this is also, what sound? Okay. That's a full-on sprint, one-handed set over the head. So trust me, that happens a lot. It happens at least once in every game, maybe more. What I'm talking about is a pass is going to go there to that area of the court. And so <clears throat> what I do with Alexis and, and all setters that I train is I recreate this right here, right? I'm gonna recreate <laughs> And I wasn't able to pause it early enough. Uh, if you focus on Izzy here, the pass and the read is what I'm going to recreate. And yeah. so that hopefully she can then react f quickly enough to get to a ball like that. So I, if you ever watch me train setters, I will shank balls here a lot <laughs> and, and randomly yeah. because, and, and, and maybe that solution presents itself and maybe it doesn't, but again, right. We're, we're talking about what a setting look like. The, the goal will remain the same. The solution will vary. And, and that's how we set up. And so how do I do this without a server? Well, I, uh, I toss or I throw the ball, I toss it, whatever, to the setter, and she will either set it back, hit it, um, or tip it back to me or pass it back to me, and then it's on. And then that's when she starts her read, and, and I pass and show her the angle, and, and we go from there. <laughs> So same, same situation, right? Yeah. Different solution this time because it's a little different. The ball was going over the ref stand, the upright. Okay. And as we know, we can't be off of the court and we can't be using the support uh, to support our weight. So here's the movement solution she came up with. And the other thing I left out earlier when I talk about um, when I'm working with setters and I have to drill this home to them is 
there is a difference between setters and volleyball players who play the setter position. Right. And I, and I, I say that a lot. And the difference is this. It's that a setter is going to make every effort to set the ball. And that could look something like this. Yeah. And, uh, and <laughs> uh, number five here is someone who's played with, with uh, Ryan, who's played with Izzy for, for three years now. And so actually, hopefully, you know, you saw in the first clip, um, there's another clip from practice. Like she, she knows I'm going to keep watching Izzy because Izzy's going to get me the ball uh, no matter what more often than not. Yeah. And so Ryan actually knows she, she scores often on, on play. As you can see on that first. Let's keep watching. <laughs> So again, here's a ball that's being passed behind her. And again, when we say look at what setting looks like, we we have them, I have them start here and move into this position and then backpedal. It's we we are I often was too patterned in where I had them start. And I realized that there are way more different situations and starting points that setters are gonna operate from and, and passes are going to come from this area you know pass yeah. is going to come from between her and the net they don't always come from between her and the end line right there's ryan scoring so you know people think that this is luck or random or what they say is um you know, I can't, I can't teach that. Um, okay, no, you, we can't teach that. Of course not, right? I don't tell Izzy, hey, hold your wrist and palm like this and face your thumb and tuck it between your knuckles. <laughs> of course not. But what we can teach is in an environment with uh, as much context as possible and openness to self-organize uh, in a way that allows them the freedom to try different things and come up with different solutions, you know, how far is a player going to get if they can only play with the things that the coach gives them? Right. No, I like that. And one thing I've been, um, that I think that you, you mentioned about her reading um, I've been trying to work on that as well um, with just trying to really focus on reading the, plas the platform so that you can get to the ball the quickest way because, like you said, the ball is random. You don't know where it's going to go. It's always going to go somewhere different. The idea, I mean, ideally, we'd like it to go high, high middle or, or you know, five by five, right. or, you know, the five foot line, but it's unrealistic sometimes most of the time mm -hmm. so just getting to the ball and reading it well enough to go directly to the ball and then from there focus on where you're finishing um i think is kind of like where my head was going with that but how do you get the player to understand that is also why i was asking you <laughs> yeah that i mean i ask them i'll ask them all the time what, what's the goal here you know, and, and my goal could be different, right? I might want them to, to swish it in the target every time. And their goal could just be, I'm coach. I'm just trying to hit the damn target, right? Yeah. I don't care if it goes in. <laughs> um, so, so it's a, an important part of CLA and what we're not going to get into today, but motivational interviewing is, um, is putting the onus on them and letting them say what they're trying to achieve. You know, a kid yeah. might come in and say, hey, well, I really want to get this footwork down because my coach has been working with me on it and I don't get it. And then the challenge there is, well, if that's what they want to do, okay, I can help you with that. But is that the real ultimate goal? You know, and, th and that's where I at times, and I, and I, I think a lot of coaches, um, 
will everyone will go through it. We we lose sight of what the real goal is. And so the two setters that I work with, okay, I will admit that they are some next level phenomenal athletes. Um, but what I try to take credit for is <clears throat> we don't take any of that away from them. And when working with athletes that maybe aren't as gifted as they are in certain certain athletic ability um, for the for let's let's call it the kid that wasn't born with those things well we all know that you know everyone can learn how right so um, if we're not taking the athleticism away we have to be sure that we give them opportunities to test and explore and develop um, and expand their athletic capabilities But then it's also, you know, with that in mind, that's also going to mean that uh, I I use this example all the time, like, hey, coach, don't waste my time teaching me an alley-oop and ask me to try to dunk the ball. I ain't ever going to be able to dunk a ball on a 10-foot hoop, you know, and and the reason for that is um, I'm not willing to put in the amount of work that would maybe one day allow me to, you know, to dunk that ball. You know, I don't want to waste all that time. I, I want to say well, I, my goals right now, coach, is teach me how to feed that ball. You know, teach me how to get the assist or teach me how to like shoot it. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, y- their physical limitations can be real and can also be a thing that uh, drives them or motivates them to different movement solutions and skill sets. Yeah. And I think that's important. I love it. I'm excited to get back in the gym now. (laughs) Yeah. And um, it's a, I I, I promise you, it's a working um, dynamic. It's a collaboration. Um, And if we, right, if we put ourselves in the shoes of the athletes and we don't know what we don't know, they might think like, I didn't even know that CLA, motivational interviewing. I don't know if you can see me on camera. I didn't even know about these things for most of my coaching uh, career, right? And so because it was something I didn't even know was an option, um, I, I could never use it and learn from it and impl- employ those things or implement those things. And youth athletes are going to be the same. If their creativity is, is limited in, in their own experiences and what they've seen, they might not know that... Uh, we'll just finish up with this they might not know that some of these other solutions are even an option or a possibility right uh i think this is should be set up to her bump set here they might not know that this is an option to set the outside right they might not know that that can set a pretty darn good ball with tempo. Yeah. And so I show them these things and I try to um, present it in a way that it doesn't seem like it's out of reach. Right. And I say, hey, have you ever fallen or rolling to your side and, and not gotten hurt? I'm like, yeah. Well, I promise you that is very similar. And if you have experience with doing that, I will say, hey, let's not get hurt or anything. But what is the goal? The goal is to be a setter. The goal is to set the ball right now to the outside hitter. So I, in practice, will toss the setter the ball. She'll set it back to me. And then I'll pass and dig it in a low trajectory that's off. And I will try to force this movement solution i like it but i don't press upon them i don't say this is how it has to be done because again like you know um i will say as i get older and i have um gained weight and i i'm I'm less active uh, i can feel it in my knees right and so like i would not be willing to do that movement at the risk of maybe tearing my knee or blowing it out. And, um, and that is a critical thing to understand as coaches that there are some real physical limitations or fears that athletes are gonna have. This willingness to <clears throat> sacrifice the body is only gonna go so far. And it is 
it is human nature to not want to um, hurt yourself or it's human nature to uh, obtain this feeling of safety and security. So, you know, we have to be sensitive and careful when teaching and, and promoting these new movement variabilities um, because you can't just dive into it right away. You know, yeah. it's in the same way that someone's going to have to learn how to write and spell. They first need to trace the letters and learn the alphabet or whatever. What I'm getting at is these movement solutions require variability or a uh, range and of movement vocabulary is how I've, I've heard it described. And you don't get that movement vocabulary um, in a traditional way of how we've either seen set or training done or how we've, we've, you know, how we've done it. It's true. Okay. Well, I knew I wasn't going to get that done in less than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> hey, at least you know yourself, right? <laughs> but I think, uh, I think there were some really good things there. And, um, you know, if you, of course, have any more questions, feel free to shoot them my way. And um, I just appreciate you always being interested in, in new ideas. Yeah, no, I loved it. That was awesome. And it gets my creative juices flowing too in ways that I can try and implement that. So like I said, I'm, re I'm ready to get back in the gym. I'm ready yeah. to try some things out. <laughs> I, I, I am too. I'm, I'm with you on that. So yeah. until then, thanks, uh, Kendall. And um, thanks everybody for, for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And we'll, uh, we'll see you in the next one. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. All right. Bye. Bye.